<clears throat> the following interview was conducted with Robert Mitch Grundem, professor in the Department of Aviation Technology for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Thursday, February 25, 2010, at his office on campus. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History of Barry. Good afternoon, Professor Grundem. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Let's start a little bit. Tell us where and when you were born and your parents in early years. I'm from Vincennes in November 5th, 46, born and raised in Vincennes. Do you have any brothers or sisters? I have one brother who's uh -huh. still in Vincennes. He okay. runs the family business that I basically ran away from to come here. That's a shoe store which specializes in custom and corrective shoes that can make a shoe for about any foot. They'll make a molded foot and by hand make a shoe for that foot. I get my shoes there. If I need shoes, I call my brother up and say, send me some shoes, and he sends shoes, and I sure. don't, never had to buy shoes anyplace else but there, and it's really kind of convenient. And my wife is also from there, so that simplifies holidays and other such festivities. We go back and forth a number of times a year. I go more than she does, but that's where we're from. Right. I graduated from Lincoln High School. Tell us a about high school. Any student clubs that you ran in? I was it a large high school? In, I don't remember. I think there were 260 some of my graduating class, 90% of whom are still alive. I didn't do a lot in high school. Uh, we got a two-hour lunch and I spent that in the pool hall. And I like to play golf, and we got out early to go practice for golf, so I did that in the latter part of high school. I got interested in airplanes, and so I messed around at the local airport. What sort of things did you do? Did tinkering at, and at helping? At the low air, local right. airport. Hung around. I washed airplanes. That was probably the big means by which I earned enough money to get a private pilot certificate, which I did on my own right after high school. And what came next? Did you go into college then after that? After high school, I spent a year at Vincennes University, kind of taking general courses. They were basically advanced high school courses. And I uh, met a woman there that I'm still married to, and <coughs> excuse me, discovered Purdue had a flight program. I came up here, tried to get into it, told it was full, couldn't get into it, so I went into management. And at that time, management had. This is at Purdue, management at Purdue. Okay. <clears throat> had what they called technical options, technical electives, and one of those was flight. And flight set aside so many spots for management, and I got one of those and basically had more flight courses and management courses. And That's interesting. Just finished basic ratings and certifications here in the last three years at Purdue. Okay. Were you married at the time you came here? No, I got married between junior and senior year, which was way too young, but okay. that's what we did. What year? What years were you at? When did you get your degree? Tell us about campus life. Where did you live on campus? I lived in, well, they were called Fowler Courts, formerly State Street Courts. At that time, it was a squat, one-story, World War II type of residence where we had units. In courts, there were six units in a court. There were nine rooms to a unit, and I lived there several years and never knew there were things called resident advisors or counselors or whatever because we had our own group and we took care of ourselves. And if we didn't make noise, we weren't bothered, and that worked out pretty well. One thing that's radically different, a couple things that are radically different now from then, is we had one telephone for. 18 guys, which was something of a problem. And Probably in the hall, right? It was, right. we had a little common area okay. that contained some tables, chairs, and a telephone. Um, I went in, into it just before they tore it down, discovered they put phones in each room, which was kind of nice. <laughs> and we ate in Fowler House, and some of our courts had women in them, which made us a educational dormitory and we had to dress up for supper like shirts ties 
dress pants with no pockets on the outside. I think the women had to wear dresses or skirts, which we hated. Every with night for dinner? Every night. The only exceptions were if the weather was bad, there was a light on Fowler House and they'd turn that on. She had to walk halfway down to Fowler House to see it. So if you dressed up, you might as well go the rest of the way and eat. Right. And the food now, as compared to then, of course my tastes are a little more cultivated, but is far superior. It's so far superior it can't be measured. And students now really don't realize how good it is. There's no comparison. We, in the beer was it was it was it served though? I mean, if you dressed up for dinner, or was it cafeteria style? It was cafeteria style, okay. and someone would say you'd point to what you want, and they'd slop it onto the tray and right. add it to the plate and slide you the tray. But in the Berrien years, we flew all over to various universities looking at dormitories and food places and to figure out how to do it here and. I think Purdue got it more right than any other university on the country, in the country. So it's really good. Mm -hmm. I just soon eat in the residence hall as any restaurant in town. Right. And they it's really changed a lot, hasn't it? Yeah. You had a bit of a walk for Can because was Cranert built at that time? So oh yeah, Cranert was built, okay. and we walked from. Because they didn't have a lot of buses that service there. No, they didn't, and we walked to the airport. Regularly, it was about a mile each way, and that was what we did. Right. You know. What um, what, what year did you graduate then? Um, May of '68. Okay. And then what? What came? You had, then what came next after that? Well, I. You know, jobs were not readily available. And were you certified for? Was your degree in management or in aviation? Or management. Okay. But I had FAA pilot certificates and I got hired as a part time instructor full time for that summer. If I behaved myself and did well, then I'd got get hired. In aviation technology department? Yes. Okay. Then I would, they would hire me full time, which is what happened. So September 1st, 68, I got hired here full time and been here ever since. Okay. All right. Let's talk a little about, were you ever in the military at all? You had no military service? No, I got fed up with this, and uh, so I went down to the Air Force recruiter and signed up and passed physicals and everything and had a class date with guaranteed flight training spot. That was when the Vietnam War was getting close to an end, and I was afraid they'd cancel the class, and there were other situations. So after getting accepted, I turned them down. And stayed here. Sure. Which I like to fly. I had, when I came here, it was the first semester that ROTC was not mandatory, but got talked into taking a semester, which was probably a good thing because I really didn't like it. And that was another one of those things that entered into the decision. I've got, I had till. They've been sold or about to be sold. Same airplanes that the Air Force has. And I've flown them a lot more with a lot less hassle and for a long, lot longer period of time. So I still like to fly. I'm 63 years old. I'm still flying airplanes. <laughs> and will be probably till I retire. Sure. And you know, over 20,000 hours of flight time. So I mean, wish I could fly more instead yeah. of sitting here doing things like trying to figure out the, some of the dumb questions they're asking is like how many volts are in the number two battery in the new Cirrus training airplanes we're getting when the number two battery is actually two batteries connected in series so now does that up the amp hours or does it the same amp hours as one battery <coughs> the manual doesn't say <laughs> well, let's talk about some of the things you're the, you're the chief flight instructor can you tell researchers what that entails well I got the position kind of by default um, previous one left. Have you been doing this for a number of years? Is well, I did it for 17 or 18 years and that was enough of that. Um, when the previous individual left, the then department head came to my house and wanted me to handle the flight portion and Laurie Groves, my partner, um, 
he would handle the academic Purdue curriculum side. He fine with me. He can do all that paperwork and deal with the PhDs on the other side of the track, and I'll take care of the FAA. And we did that for I don't know, like I said, 17 years or whatever. And then the SFO supervised flight operations or turbine flight operations got to be too much. And I was gone all the time. I was gone when we had the fatal accident. So the one here, mm, the student. And I told them, I said, enough of this, this isn't working, something, Larry can do all that stuff and I'll do something else. So basically I have been flying those airplanes a lot, the, the turbine airplanes, still a pilot examiner, so I do check rides and teach a couple classes and they leave me pretty much alone. Oh, okay. What about, uh, you're the coach of the General Aviation Flight Technology, you're still the co-chair of that? No, oh, I okay. quit that. Well, back about the time I quit being chief flight instructor, Larry Groves. What, what did that entail for the research? What did, was that? Well, curriculum okay. matters. Okay. And, and like I said, Larry took care of scheduling and pairing instructors with students, which we did by hand, kind of still do by hand, even though the slots are computerized, but the matching of students with instructors and part-time instructors while well, the rest of the university complains about graduate instructors, we use undergraduate instructors. We have juniors teaching sophomores. <coughs> Every flight school in the country does it. And those people are matched. You get personality situations. And so, you know, it's all done by hand. Larry takes care of all that. Right. I don't have to worry about it. Do you uh, take the, the students or instructor they with on a plane? Is that... Oh, well, I take them in our King Airs. Have you seen those? Well, no. I'll show you one here in the jet. And yes, I do not do any basic primary instruction leading to original licenses or certificates, as the FAA calls them, and rating, such as instrument rating, mole engine rating, and so on. I give tests for those. The FAA has a policy where they kind of separate you examiners from instructors okay. and your examiner well you can still instruct but most examiners really don't do much instructing okay. they tell the instructors how to do it what the common errors are what points need to be emphasized and then the examiners give the test okay in your FAA do you have to be is a recertification do you have to every year every, every year you do is that a, a written test that you have to take or can flight. Oh, oh, flight. Now, every two years there is a written test. There's a, a geez, I don't know what the last course was, one day or two day uh, seminar recurrent. In fact, I don't even remember when the last one was. Uh, geez, 2009, I don't even remember that. <coughs> it was less than a year ago. But we go for a day and then there's a test and you have to get 70 on it. If you don't get 100, you're an idiot. Um, and then they observe us doing a flight test once a year. So that's how we're recertified okay. as a designated pilot examiner. And for those that don't know, a designated pilot examiner is like the, the parallel in the non-aviation world would be a driver's license examiner okay. or someone 16, 17, how many, many years comes to take a driving test we do the same thing, except it's in an airplane. Right. And okay. in the airplane, there's more than one type of test you can do. And there's different types. Do you have to take tests for different type of planes that you are, are, are can? Well, fly? I'm authorized for private pilot, private airplane, instrument rating airplane, commercial pilot airplane, multi-engine airplanes, any reciprocating multi-engine airplane, uh, flight instructor original issuance, although the FAA, thank God, does most of those. Um, Flight instructor add-on ratings, like instrument instructor, mole engine instructor, and flight instructor recertification. Flight instructors have to be recertified every two years, so I can do those tests also. I can also do what's known as the airline transport pilot test, which doesn't mean you're an airline pilot, it's just a higher class of certificate or license, as the general public would call it, that the FAA has. It's a more stringent uh, standard flight test. 
when the students graduate and then they go with the airline, are there more exams that they have to take, or what? What's the next? Yeah. Thing, what happened for the researchers once the student graduates mm -hmm. and they want to go? Well, into once if they're lucky enough to get employed by an airline as a co-pilot, they have to take basically a type rating ride, simulator check ride every year, and of course a physical every year. When they become captain, there's two physicals a year and two check rides a year, so they're they're. Line, job is on the line four times a year once they become captain. Mm. That's quite a bit. And yeah. is, that true, is it true for the major airlines as well as the s smaller ones? It's true for all Part 121 carriers, and that includes the re regionals, R121 character, 121 operators, the major air carriers, the freight guys, same check rate, same set of rules. What about those that say work for companies like UPS and FedEx? UPS and FedEx are 121 operators, oh, okay. same deal. Okay, good, that's a good point. Researchers will benefit by that. And then um, in 71 to 76 for the research, you were the examining check pilot for a private? Yeah, that was kind of an odd duck. Did we, you do it here or? Yeah, I did it here. Okay. Basically, it allowed me to do just what I'm doing now, to do a private pilot check ride. The okay. private pilot is the lowest level of license certificate that allows people to have an airplane and carry passengers and go places whenever they want to. Sure, okay. At that time, we operated under what was called uh, FAR 141. The FAA called it an approved school, which implies that anything else is unapproved, but that is not the case. It's just there's two ways to meet the requirements. It's a lot of hassle. Um, and it's very restrictive. If you want to make one change, it, you have to send the change to the FAA and they'll sit on their desk for a while and they'll think about it and they'll, well, we don't like this, you need to change that, and it goes mm -hmm. back and forth. A lot of it takes forever and we finally dumped the whole thing. But under FAR 141, I could do the private pilot check ride, but I could not actually issue the private pilot certificate. We had, to, congratulations, you passed, you're grounded for two weeks. Well, we sent the logbook and all the paperwork to Indianapolis. They would look at it and they would issue a temporary private pilot certificate, send it back, and okay, now you can start flying again. We got rid of that in what I, I was 74, 75, 76, right. someplace in there when we start operating operating under what's known as FAR Part 61, which gives us a lot more flexibility to do things, and it's actually cheaper for the students. Um, and better, we can change things faster, we can change test questions, we can even change test questions under that set of rules. Uh, that's 141 still exists, but we don't want to go there. We really don't want to go there. We've talked to people who are there and they wish they weren't. Yeah. Uh, local FA office says, please don't do that because it would take one person just to supervise our operation. Right. So we dumped that and the FAA also had this designated pilot examiner program where you did the same thing except when they passed check ride you'd type out a temporary airman certificate they called here you go I get the old one I send it off to FAA and they microfilm it and that's that and it's a done deal so I've been doing that since 76 okay. do you offer you don't offer lessons for private pilots do you at the school my Purdue or do they oh yes oh. Yeah. Generally in the summer because we're so full up in the fall. Sure. But if I someone did President Hansen take some lessons yeah, here? Yeah, he did. And he got sir and he, he He got a private pilot certificate right. and when Stephen Bearing came the trustees wrote him his contract that he would not fly in a single engine airplane because they didn't want because he was an aviation enthusiast as well. And they did didn't want Did President Hansen actually fly a plane? Oh yeah. Yeah. Not a, a private plane or his own? Yeah, one of our little trainers. Yeah. <laughs> but he got certified. I gave, I, in fact, I gave him some instruction toward that. I didn't give him his check ride, but. Uh, interesting. Uh, he must. This was after he came. Oh he yeah. Had an interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I flew in. I flew him around in our airplane that we fly him around in. Yeah. Some also. So. Yeah, but the trustees didn't want the president to kill himself and then have to spend another year and a half trying to find a president, you know, because finding a president is not chief. 
you know, it costs a lot of money to fly all over the country with all these people and sure. set up clandestine meetings here and there. And right. the planes, the president's planes, have changed over time, have they not? The ones a that little. They have? Okay. The fleet we have right now. How many? Do you only have two in the fleet or three? Well, we have three now. Okay. France is selling them. Mm. Um, we have two King Air 200s and a Beachjet. Originally, that program was called supervised flight operations, where we would take a junior or senior program faculty member and we would take someone someplace that started out with presidents, mm -hmm. but it degenerated to, uh, we call everybody you can possibly imagine, from murderers to bus drivers to you know, pick somebody, we call them students. Uh, um, but that program started in spring of 68 when we were given a Model 18 Beechcraft by, uh, I believe it was Anaconda, Copper, and Wire. And interestingly enough, I was the first student in that program. And it was because oh, nice. I was something of a black sheep in the flight program. I was kind of in the program, but I really wasn't because I was manager. in management. You know, I nobody that's interesting. nobody told me about CODO in, or that's what we called it back then. And so I got stuck in management. Well, for me to get my Molly engine rating, we had an old Air Force Twin Beach. We called them. It was actually a C-45H civilian version. It was called a Model 18. And that had been given by, to us by the Air Force, and so I got my mold engine rating in that. Well, to use as a trainer. To way. use as a trainer. Now, this was a big airplane 900 horsepower, 50 gallons of gas an hour, big old junk. It's an Air Force air, big plane, right? Yeah. And it wasn't as big as DC 3s, which is what the rest of the students, like my partner Larry Gross, got his rating in. Well, I flew the Twin Beach. We got the gift from Anaconda Wire. I flew SF supervised flight operations and then I had about 75 hours. I did a lot of that SF Boeing. And everybody else got theirs in the DC-3. Well, in the Purdue Airlines had, well, Purdue Airlines ceased to exist literally overnight. Yeah. And now you had all these people that needed molding engine ratings and all we had was a Twin Beach and I was the only one with experience. So. I started flying that, and they there were enough of them where they checked one other instructor out, and he and I used to live across the street from each other, so we'd ride to work and you know got along, did a lot of stuff together. Sure. And you know, he left here, went back to Ohio, and I inherited the program. The then chief flight instructor didn't like the airplane, refused to fly it, so I was made chief flight instructor of the Moldy Engine program. At Purdue, and which is fine for me because that was a little easier work than a lot of the other stuff. But that's how I became an examiner. Mm -hmm. uh, to be an examiner, a designated pilot examiner, you had to have a need. There had to be a need. So I called him up one day and said, "I need 15 mole engine check rights." And all of a sudden, the needs created. I called him back the next day and said, "I was wrong. There's 16." And so they made me an examiner, and it's kind of grown and mushroomed and mutated since then. Yeah. Um, we had, after the Twin Beach, Twin Beach, we finally started using that, the, the newer Twin Beach for mole engine training. They bought a Navajo for supervised flight operations, hired an old Marine guy to fly it. And he flew about 300 hours a year or so, the students, and then Hanson left and John Hicks was an interim president and John Hicks, whom we almost killed in that Navajo. Um, these are of course are jet planes, though, right? Pardon all me? these are all jets. No. Or oh, not? No. Navajo was a reciprocating engine propeller driven oh, okay. airplane. And they got with John Hicks on board, the pilot, got a little low one night, hit a tree out short of the runway. Limbs about like that, mashed in the wing. I think I, I had some pictures. I must have thrown them away. I don't know why I would mm -hmm. do that, but I did. Somehow they managed to land the airplane. No injuries. Airplane was bashed up. But anyway, John Hicks bought a King Air, a King Air ninety, and the year before Bering came, mm -hmm. and I heard, probably. I heard John Hicks say that that was the best thing he did when he was president. 
uh, Fred Ford about rolled over in his grave, even though he's not dead. He just turned red and puffed up like a, I don't know what. But anyway, um, that was a million dollar airplane. Oh, I bet. And when we bought it, we got given four pilot slots. I got number four slot. And I just started doing flying that a lot. And it when and Barry came, he bought another one, and then he bought a, a diamond jet, which I'll show you what they look like here in a minute. And then in '94, we got rid of the '90 King Air, bought the first 200 model King Air, which is bigger. '98, we bought the jet and another King Air 200, and we've had that fleet since '98. Yeah. Great fleet of airplanes. We've flown everybody all over. Okay. I mean, I've been border to border, coast to coast. You don't, do you just fly within the United States? Or I don't know. We, well, or? now, I don't know what we do now. Okay. Um, with the economy the way it is, uh, it's been decided that people's time is not worth what they think it is, and it's better to put them on an airliner. But we've, we used to go to Canada quite a bit. I've been to Toronto, Montreal, a little place called Guelph, oh, yeah. um, Calgary, Edmonton, Mexico. I've been with Purdue just to Monterey, but I've been to other, to other places in Mexico with other operators. So I've been all over with Do Purdue. Do the, stu the students get experience? Do the, uh, they still have stu the students help with the flying? Always. Okay. Yeah, that was the great thing about our program. We did something that no one else did. And that was, everybody gives students basic gradings and certifications. After that, there's nothing. We gave them real world experience. I mean, we go- Like hands on. Hands on, yes, they get to do take off and landings. It might be the president of the university and we're going down a runway like this because they haven't flown an airplane before. That's the way it is. Sit back and enjoy the ride. Uh, and that is, if not ending, being severely reduced, which is too bad because we're the only ones that did that. Now no one does it. What is the number of, of uh, AVE tech departments across the country approximately? Are there many schools? I don't know. There's oh. a couple dozen anyway. Were, okay, okay. The, but this the, is the only one in Indiana, is that correct? Or is there another one? Uh, Vincennes University has a program. It's currently out of Lawrenceville. They're shutting it down and moving to Indianapolis, and they're going to do contract. They're just going to farm it out to whoever gets the bid. I think it's going to somebody at Mount Comfort, so you'll have non-university personnel doing that. Uh, Terre Haute, Indiana State, has a flight program, and I think they contract the flying portion out, and the profs do the ground portion. Mm -hmm. So we're not the only ones. We're the only ones that do it like this. Sure, exactly. Uh, let me ask on students in diversity. You have uh, both male and female. When you we first do now. came, when you first came, was it more so male? Yeah. Oh, okay. No okay. girls. Okay. And what sort of positions do some of the the students can uh, apply for when they finish for their researchers? Do some go into different types of flight, like well, they management? go to wherever they can get a job. Okay. Uh, back when the regional hiring was hot white hot. There were some that got jobs before they even graduated. And you know, they missed graduation because they were in school on whatever regional airline they had been employed by. That situation no longer exists. What do they do now? Whatever they can get a job at. Flight instruction, if they know a company that they intern with, sometimes they can do that. I, it's difficult now. Okay. That'll change. Oh yeah, right. There's peaks and valleys on a lot of those things, and um, and do some go with say for, with company, private companies that have their own. Uh, they can budget? do that. Okay. Generally, the companies with jets require jet time, and of course, these students graduate, they might have 300 hours total time, and that's nothing in the business world. So they're not really qualified to do that. Now, to play the devil's advocate when this program with the Phenom gets going and they graduate, if they're good enough, with a turbojet type rating in the Phenom, 
that will help them out, but they still have no flight time, no real experience going A to B. And you know, all their experience is gonna be flying, basically flying around in circles. Okay. And <clears throat> that will have minimal value. As far as the job placement is concerned, okay. Another complication is the Buffalo accident, which some member of Congress has decided to take on his own, that everybody should have an airline transport pilot certificate. Fine. Uh, the people that were in that accident That's had airline... About the year and a half ago, the one up there. Yeah, yes. had airline transport pilot certificates, and more than the minimum time he's pro proposing and still managed to wreck the airplane. So... <coughs> There, there's the FAA really is not in favor, and the airlines are not necessarily in favor of that proposal. They would rather because someone could buy a cheap airplane, fly it back and forth across country ten times, get the fifteen hundred hours. Here I am. That's not the same as going through a collegiate program where you might end up with a turbojet type rating or or some other strictly controlled learning experience. How that's going to come out, we don't know yet. Right. Nobody knows. And you know, if a type rating helps them get a job, and then then we're then in the we're the, the yeah. forefront of the program. Sure. Okay. <clears throat> but you are the you you su you're the you supervise the flight operations of the King Air and the Mitsubishi at the moment, right? Uh, well, I, I fly the airplanes. Okay. I do a lot of that. Who's actually in charge of that program? I guess Mike Suko. I'm not sure who my boss okay. is really. How many hours in a, on an average in a year do you, does it vary that you fly? Um, Are last those year, he's looking at these yellow pieces of paper. <laughs> yeah, I keep track of that. Um, well, last year in 08, where do I have in mind up there? I've got that. That's all right. That's um, okay. I flew less last year. It was 340 hours or something than any time in the last, since I've been working here. Yeah, and most was probably about 650 hours a year, right. which was a lot because that's go and sit and wait, and I was gone all the time, and that was not good. Do you fly the? Uh, what about athletics? Do they use the Purdue planes as well? Uh, for recruiting, yes. Um, I think one time. What I about the bowls? They do uh, when they were go to the bowls. Oh, they the charter athletes? airliners. Oh, do they? Okay. Oh yeah, we can't carry near enough people for that. The only team we've carried with any degree of regularity, and that's really scarce, has been the golf teams. Okay. We could carry um, one coach and six players, or two coaches and five players, all their stuff, throw them in a king air, and get them to where they wanted to go in a pretty short period of time. Um, that's expensive, and it's Sometimes it's usually more expensive than airliners, so Glenn Tompkins exists that they take airliners and it takes two extra days for to do that tough. Right. It's cheaper. Yeah. The cost is a big factor then. <clears throat> uh, we talked off camera a little bit before, but that uh, if you talk about the accident prevention counselor for FAA that you, just to, just as a point, because I think researchers be sort of interested in that. Oh, yeah. Are you still doing it as a counselor? I, don't know. Oh. Um, that says 2005, 2006. I probably am as okay. default from being a pilot examiner. Basically, if you see something bad going on, you talk to the pilot. Well, I do that every day here, and I don't keep track of all that sure. type of contact between pilots. And we have a safety officer, Brian Dillman, who does that mostly with the everyday operation, and you know, I don't do too much of that. A flight accident counselor, what I would, if there's been some sort of an accident, are you doing counseling of the people? Is that, I mean, if a well, researcher I, I, asked me that, I'd say, I'm not real sure. Well, we advise and counsel and coach if, you okay. know, we see someone doing something they shouldn't be doing. Okay. Um, if someone is involved in an accident, that's the point I was trying to get across, which... The FAA may require them to have additional instruction and counseling. I don't do that for free. Okay. Uh, and I haven't, I don't know if I... Uh, last year, I think I there were a couple 
people that were involved in stupid mm -hmm. pilot tricks and the FAA sent them to me and that's fine because I get paid for that and they get off pretty easy dollars wise and time wise sure. and then they're back in the game. Right. Okay. Thank you. And you're still teaching, the, he teaches the two courses, the flight instructor lectures. I teach and flight the, instructor lectures. I teach people how to teach flying in airplanes and I've had zero education courses. Uh, but having been here 41 years, I pretty much learned how to write multiple choice mm -hmm. test questions and essay questions that don't have more than one possible answer. And what, what to is say... This, are these senior courses? What level would this be? Are they junior? It's a 300 level course, but okay. mostly it's sophomore fours that take it. Okay. We do it once a year. It's a four hour course and currently meeting this semester at 7.30 in the morning. And, yeah, I still do that. And I prowl, pound and preach and yell and carry on and stomp my fist and <laughs> pound my fist. And if something's in a red on the board, they darn well better know because it it's on the test. <laughs> okay. All righty. Um, Brackley Fellow, for the researchers, just tell about your involvement with that back trial program. I never knew it existed, even though it started when I may have been here in one day. Well, I think President Hub it started in Hubby's era. Yeah, I didn't know it. Right. Um, a lot of people don't know who started it, but that's true. I flew Fred. I was sitting in office one day and some students said, you ought to be a faculty fellow, come to lunch. And so I went to lunch and they made me a faculty fellow over at uh, Fowler House. Oh my and goodness, I'm coming home. <laughs> and yeah, I thought, gee whiz, how ironic is this? So I did that and on and off. And then they tore down Fowler when they built Hillenbrand. And all those of us who were in Hillenbrand or in Fowler by default were become faculty fellow, became faculty fellows in Hillenbrand. And it got a little more active then. Sure. Um, I got to know the manager or whatever they called him at that time of Hillenbrand, John Richardson. And, you know, we had students and, you know, it, and and the rules changed. You didn't eat just there. You could eat other places and it kind of snowballed for there. And this semester is, this year has been quite active uh, with the students because they come and get me and say, you know, when's lunch? Where are we eating today? What time? Where do we want to go today? Um, Another group, a bunch of the freshmen said, we're Hillenbrand Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 1230, come every day, you know. So. That makes it easier. Yeah. That's oh, very yeah. nice. Yeah, they want here. You can set, that's right, you can set your schedule. <laughs> um, a couple of awards, the um, that Indianapolis General Aviation District Office Accident Prevention Council award that you got. I think what happened is the Indianapolis office had an award, they had to give it to somebody, so they gave it to me. That Ed was, I don't know. I. It's not nice. the the accident prevention counselors basically are the also the pilot examiners and the pilot examiners who did good work they were happy with and so I got a plaque to hang okay. on the wall someplace. <laughs> they, any other, any the, other awards that you'd like to share with us? No. Okay. Um, professional associations. Do you belong to any or attend any meetings, conventions, etc.? There's no uh, academic. Aviation hmm. Technology Comparable Association? Well, you know, a lot of these guys belong to University Aviation Association oh, okay. so and, they, and they go off to meetings. Sure. And so they, there, is, a, there they, is an association. They sit on behind the desk and they do things and I go out and fly airplanes. Okay, sounds good to me. Uh, family, tell us about that. One wife, you? four daughters. Did they come to Purdue? Wife did graduate from Purdue. Okay, what did she get her degree in? Basically, it was home ec. Okay. At that time, it was called home ec. I don't know that it exists now. In fact, I don't know if Dennis Saviano is going to have a job after July 1st because it's becoming something else. But what he's going to be doing, I don't know. Who's this now? One of your children? Dennis Saviano is dean of consumer and family sciences, which used to be called home ec. And that's what it was when I was here. And my mother said, maybe they offer um, sewing, and you could learn how to mend some things. And I said. <laughs> no. At that time, they did offer sewing, <laughs> and my wife 
did do some did she, uh, teaching. Did she okay. And she wanted to be a teacher, but we ended up with four girls. Uh, but she did some in the local high schools and, and sure. that kind of thing. But that's not, no what, more. Well, what do your, your children do? Where are they located? Well, two of them are in Fort Wayne okay. with four grandkids apiece. One's in Crown Point with one and a half grandkids. And another one's in Germany messing around as an Army civilian. And what is an Army civilian? What's she works in a daycare for the Army. She graduated and was a nanny for a while and got tired of that, didn't like college, and now uh, has a daycare at an Army base in Stuttgart, Germany. She likes it? Yeah, they pay her okay, pay her most of her rent anyway. And sure. So she's over in Germany and flits around Europe and does what she wants to when she wants to. Well, you can go and visit her. you got somebody place to stay. We did that once, and that's enough. Oh. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. um, what about some of your hobbies? I think you got uh, golf is one of them. Hmm? I play right. golf um, when I can. There's a bunch of guys, a former basketball coach calls me fairly regularly to play golf. Who's that? Who are that? Uh, coach Katie. Okay. And I flew him around a lot. But we never had a chance to play golf together until he, he, he retired, and that's all he does is play golf, basically. So, because one of the things they gave him as a retirement gift, as I recall, was for he for he and Pat to do go to Las Vegas or someplace and play golf out there. That could have been. He's got his tournament out there, which I think is yeah, in maybe. the first week and second week in May. Uh -huh. um, but it's a good group we play with because we're all about the same proficiency. Uh, more or less the same age and old farts, you know, and so we do Have our thing. We can do it at the same time. We like this time of day, and it, it works out. So, you know, one thing in life that's really hard to find is a friend, and if I define a friend as somebody that likes to do what you do, can do it when you can do it, and can do it at about the same proficiency level as you do it. So if... <coughs> it equals the playing field. <laughs> it does. Excuse me. So... That works out well. Play golf, also go fishing. I just soon go fishing yeah. as play golf. If you can catch fish, if you don't catch fish, I know I'm that's just another soon one. Go play golf. Okay. Where do you do fishing? Where do you fish? In the Wabash? <clears throat> no. I found the best place around here to go fishing is northwestern Ontario. About a 19-hour drive. Okay. We go once a year. Okay. Okay. In the in the what time of year do you go? In the fall or? Third week in June. Okay. Uh, the second best place to fish is my brother's pond down in Vincennes. Sounds good. That's closer. So, uh, yeah, it's still a three-hour drive. <laughs> uh, do you have a uh, Purdue tradition that you would like to share with us? Any? A Purdue tradition. Mm -hmm. Like maybe the Boilermaker special or something like that? No, although I've rented it a couple times for various occasions. Sure. Um, That's kind of nice. <clears throat> yeah. It comes around our neighborhood for some reason frequently or during the warm when it months. When I see it, <clears throat> I always honk. And I'm wondering mm -hmm. if people saying, why is that lady honking at that, you yeah. know, engine? <laughs> it's tradition that you're supposed to do. We go, my wife got involved in liking women's basketball, so we go to all the women's basketball games. Football games, we generally babysit. And basketball, men's games, are, it's cold, it's dark. And women's games are nice. We end up watching it on TV. Mostly. Sure, right. And I get really worked up at men's basketball games and I told Matt the other night we went somewhere I said I just can't watch your game you're too too intense I get so worked up I gotta walk <laughs> away from the TV you know? uh, how about do you have an outstanding event that uh, comes to mind anything special it doesn't have to be necessarily be Purdue related because sometimes people ask me that I said not necessarily I remember first solo was an outstanding event I was quite euphoric about how old were you uh, I was pretty old. I was 17, and usually 16 is the usual age, but I was a little behind there. But I don't know. You know, breaking your first kid. First kid I held was the first time I'd held a kid that was like that. I had no experience with girls, women, you know, and no offense, they tend to not think the way men do. And I still don't know how to deal with that. <clears throat> Where'd you do your first solo? Well, I learned to fly down at uh, Vincennes at Lawrenceville, which was right 
there. Okay. What kind of plane did you have? I had, believe it or not, a Piper Cub. A genuine... And you're flying by yourself? Solo? Piper Cub. Well, that's why I took my lessons in, and then the instructor got out, and I made the first solo flight. That's the, a big step in learning how to fly is your first solo step flight. Good done. That's outstanding. You mark that down in your, in your diary. Don't forget it. June 11, 1964. Okay. Any closing comments or something for that I didn't, that I have, did not ask that you'd like to share with us? Any, any, anything? Mm, no, not really. Other than I still like to fly, and I like to fly do you have, but high, you don't fast, have own, far, gadgets. You don't have your own plane, though, do you? No, okay. I've got a boat. Okay, well, that's When good. I get out of here, I, you know, play golf or fish if the weather is good enough. If the weather's bad, I pout. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I generally get up pretty early and, and do some kind of strenuous exercise for an hour. Okay. Ishmael Center or swim. You run too, don't you? I did. Oh. Uh, but I can't do that anymore. Okay. Something back here says you can't do that anymore. The swimming is good for you. Yeah. And the you swim in the pool, the one over here? Yeah, I go to the aquatic center. Yeah. It's nice. Um, it's a nice facility. Yeah. And uh, I've actually played golf with Dan Ross a number of times, so I know him pretty well. And he's frequently there in the morning, early sure. when we are. When I am, I, I get there when before they open, which is at six. Okay, that's the only time I can do that. The rest of the time is too much other stuff right. going exactly. on. Okay, so. I want to thank you very much, Mr. Brown. This sure. has been very good. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I was going to ask you.